The first paper, as I already mentioned, I read from was The Exercise End in the Brain, because I'm also a person who is very interested in this kind of way of thinking and putting the brain as part of the body. And uh, I wanted to ask you, which is the metaphor of the brain that is the basis for the interpretation of the data you um, collect from your experimental setup? The, the metaphor? Hmm, that's, that's a, a difficult one. Um, perhaps I can answer the question by telling you why that paper happened. Um, it's the fruit from a from a long maturation of thinking about limits to endurance performance um, and the realization that in the physiology literature up to a certain date everything was discussed except the brain so per perhaps you could call it the, the forgotten member of the family um, the, the little last one that was just not talked about but which was, in a way, quite, quite kind of amazing and and um, and paradoxical, because the brain is such a tremendous important organ. Uh, um, I would uh, my my view on things is, and of course I'm I'm a I'm a very Cartesian person, um, uh, looking at life and reality in, in a very scientific way. I mean that's my professional deformation I can't help it so, so the distinction of uh, of mind and matter and uh, or brain and the rest of physiology all that I find terribly artificial it's just one thing and uh, um, your, your legs won't work without a brain and your brain won't work without legs uh, um, uh, etc of course there is some possibility to work and uh, survive with without one or, or two legs but you, you see my point and that was something that I realized uh, along my research and um, finally brought me to proposing this to the scientific community and interestingly it was very badly received initially and it's wonderful this this paper that came out in the European Journal of Applied Physiology was actually a paper that was asked to me to be written not on that topic I was free to choose the topic but for a celebration of the retirement of a former supervisor of mine and a supervisor of many other people, Professor Paolo Ceretelli, a very famous Italian uh, exercise physiologist and expert on altitude physiology. And um, for this celebration issue, uh, former pupils of his and collaborators uh, were, were asked to write an article. So I did too. I was also asked to write an article. And I said, hey, this is maybe the occasion that I can try to get my ideas out because I had get great trouble getting it accepted reviewers would reject my thinking etc you know that I mean that's that science science is not that pure as we sometimes or sometimes think it is and and if there is kind of paradigm shifts that announce themselves sometimes they have great difficulty coming through so what happened I wrote the article and it was sent off to two reviewers but they couldn't really refuse it. It wasn't on invitation. And of course, they gave, they gave their criticisms and they actually helped me improve the paper. And then the paper came out and, and was, it was actually quite well received. And if you look now, it's very interesting. Among the papers in that issue, it's the better cited one and it's still very well cited. So it, ac it actually strung uh, a string and, and, and got resonance. And uh, the fact that you read it and knew about it already tells her, uh, hey, you see, um, apparently uh, it was time that this paper came out. So I'm very happy that that happened. And I've had a lot of very positive feedback. And, um, and of course, other people have been thinking about this too. It's not just me. I mean, um, I'm just in my time, you know, serendipity and, and, and you're standing on the shoulders of giants and everything. Tim Noakes, of course, is the, is the great other mm -hmm. uh, guy who, um, who, uh, who has been pursuing thinking in, in this direction. Could you shortly summarize the experimental results that led you to write this paper? Yes, I can. Um, what led me to the paper was an experiment I did uh, in, um, in the Himalaya at 5,000 meters. We spent some time in a research laboratory, the Pyramid, very nicely Italian design uh, pyramid uh, located uh, in the Kumbu Valley on the way to the Mount Everest base camp uh, where after three weeks I asked subjects to do different types of exercise. Uh, one exercise was just lifting a weight dynamically with a forearm 
and uh, and I looked at muscle fatigue uh, and, uh, and and endurance. Um, I repeated the same exercise also while at low altitude, and I compared the two. Interestingly, for a small muscle group, just using your forearm, not very much difference. They did about as well once acclimatized at high altitude as they did at sea level. I also asked them to pedal as hard as they could on a bicycle, once at low altitude and also at high altitude. There the difference was dramatic. They could not do at all as well as high altitude as they did at sea level. Now I use a trick. What I did is when they gave up at high altitude, they just fell off their bike and, and complained, I have to stop. I mean, the typical end point of a, of a very hard endurance type of exercise, either in sports or in the laboratory. There's a point where it just doesn't work anymore. You have to stop. The brain kicks in. What I did, I acutely gave them an amount of oxygen that immediately brought them back, virtually, to low altitude. They had a very hard time for a couple of seconds, but then suddenly they were able to continue cycling, as if they were not fatigued at all. So what happened? I mean, they were dead. They had to give up. And they clearly showed fatigue in the sense that they couldn't contract their muscles anymore. So what happened? You can't just turn away fatigue from your muscles instantaneously just by a few breaths of oxygen. So something else must have happened. Well, obviously the answer is the brain. The brain was suffering from one way or the other from the lack of oxygen and had shut off the possibility of activating the muscles while uh, being exposed to uh, hypoxia. And at the moment that the brain was exposed to normoxia, normal oxygen levels, it could just continue to drive the muscles as if nothing had happened. Um, I have just read a paragraph from you, Danes with Brains. This was because it was so outstanding, this title. I have to look at this one. And um, again, it's the brain, and you already mentioned it. I mean, um, the brain seems to be an underestimated and neglected, and also neglected organ of exercise physiology, not only exercise physiology. Um, do you have in somehow a history why it happened like this? Why is the brain under-researched in the way it is? Does it change? Oh, th that's probably because it's so complicated. Um, it's, it's, it's a complicated organ, but it's also complicated to look in it. I mean, think about the muscle. We've been doing all kinds of awful stuff to muscles also in humans, not also in animals, laboratory animals, but also in humans. We, we stick needles in veins and arteries, we actually stick needles in the muscle, we take muscle biopsies and we look what's happening in the muscle, etc. You can't do that with the brain, obviously. Uh, a transcranial brain biopsy, uh, no, no way. So um, it, it's kind of difficult to get into what's happening. So you have to initially be very indirect. This is what's hap what we have been doing for, for uh, the last few years. But now modern technology allows us to slowly get a look inside. Exercise physiology adds uh, an additional um, uh, burden or, or, or threshold that makes it hard, is uh, its movement artifact. I mean, it would be wonderful to uh, to look into the brain of somebody who is uh, swimming uh, his lap uh, during a triathlon, but there's no way that we can do that for the moment. Um, so we have, again, limits to what we can do, which makes life very difficult for the scientists interested in this, but, but we're getting better at, at it. Today in the lab, even on a bike, we can look at uh, the electric activity of the brain with surface electrodes, uh, electroencephalogram measurements start to be interpretable thanks to the advancements of technology. Um, fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is kind of scans where you look at what happens inside the brain uh, by using sophisticated big magnets in which you lie down. Uh, of course, constrain the subject with their head. They can't move their head, otherwise you can't get an image. But it's now possible to use ergometers or devices on which you do an effort like cycling or, or pinching with your fingers or something like that uh, in all kinds of experimental conditions and get an idea of what happens in the brain. And there are a few groups in the world, one is in Zurich actually, um, that are doing very, very interesting work in this field. So my answer is, in the beginning it was very hard, 
Because how, how can you get a look into the brain? That's why it was kind of forgotten. It was much more easier to look at blood, the heart, the muscle, etc. And now we're starting to get the technology necessary to be able to get a look inside.